In this lecture, we will address very important point that is seven testing principles. Let's see the first principle. The first principle says that testing shows the presence of defects, not their absence. Let's break this down. The first point is testing can show that defects are present. So when we carry out testing and find a defect, then we know that there is a problem with the software. So testing can show that defects are present. The second point is that testing cannot prove that there are no defects. Just because you have not found a defect does not mean that there are no defects in the software. So testing can't prove absence of defects. The final point is that testing reduces the probability of undiscovered defects. So let's try to understand these points with an example. Suppose you have 20 defects in a software, and when you perform testing, you find 5 defects out of it. So you have 20 defects, and you found 5. So the remaining defects are 15, which could not be found. So this is why we say that testing can show that defects are present. We found five, so we know for sure that there are five defects in the software. But we cannot prove that there are no defects in the software. We found five of 20 defects, but there are 15 left that we don't know about. So we cannot prove that there are no defects left in the software. And finally, testing reduces the probability of undiscovered defects. How does that happen? Initially, we had 20 defects, but we found 5, so only 15 are left. We have reduced the number of defects that the customer can find, so that was the first principle of testing. Let's move to the second principle. Principle 2 says that exhaustive testing is impossible. Please remember this, that exhaustive testing is impossible. The first point to understand about this is testing everything is not feasible. Just because we have a software doesn't mean we can test every single bit of it. The second point is, whenever we do testing, it has to depend on risk analysis. What is the risk of that particular system? Depending upon that we have to see what kind of testing is required. Then, we focus on what type of test techniques are needed and what are the priorities of different features. We can't just test everything. We need to prioritize certain parts based on how important they are. The final point is to focus test effort. When we're testing a feature, we need to know how much effort it requires. This is why exhaustive testing is impossible. Testing requires a certain amount of effort, and that is why testing everything is not feasible. Let's use an example here. Say a customer's requirement is the following. LED shall glow when speed is between 15 and 90 kilometers per hour. So there is a LED that will only glow when the speed is between 15 and 90. One way of testing this requirement is to do a boundary value analysis. For this test, we have taken six values. On one end, we have 14, 15, and 16. And on the other end, we have 89, 90, and 91. So when we do the testing, the lead should not glow at 14 or 15, and on the other, it should not glow for 90 or 91. It should only work for 16 and 89. So only by using six values, we can test if the software meets the customer's requirement. But it is also possible to test with all the values between 15 to 90 but that will consume a lot of time and effort. Also, the boundary values serve our purpose. 
So this is the reason that we say that testing each and every part of the feature is not feasible. It is possible, but not practical. Of course, if the customer asks us, then we can perform testing on all the values in between. Let's look at the third principle of testing now. Principle 3 states that every testing saves time and money. Let's break that down. The first point is that static and dynamic test activities should be started as early as possible. What does that mean? It means that we should start testing as early as possible, whether it is a static test or a dynamic test. Now, let's look at the second point. Early testing is sometimes referred to as shift left. Why is that? Look here. As I'm talking about early testing, I'm shifting to the left of the diagram. The very first stage of testing is at the leftmost corner of the software development life cycle. So early testing is sometimes called shift left. And finally, we come to the last point. It helps to reduce or eliminate costly changes. We can see it in the example to understand that. So here is a very popular graph about the cost and time of finding defects. As you can see, in the requirement stage, the cost of locating a defect is the lowest. When you move to the design stage, it becomes a little costlier. Then, as you move to the build stage and then to the test stage, it gets more and more expensive. Finally, at live use, it is the costliest to discover a defect in the product. So why does this happen? To understand this, we need our life cycle diagram. Suppose we find a defect in the implementation stage, which is the build stage. Just because it was found at this stage does not mean that the error happened here. It might be in the design or the system requirement. It can also be that someone misunderstood the user's requirements, because of which every subsequent stage was wrong and we implemented it incorrectly. So now, to correct this one defect, we have to go back and correct this document, this document, this document, and this one too. All of this will take a lot of time, labor, and resources which means that it will cost a lot of money. This is why Principle 3 says perform testing as early as possible. If we find an error here, then we can correct it here, and every other stage will be fine. Now we are on the fourth principle of testing. Principle 4 states that defects cluster together. To understand this, Let's start with the first point. Sometimes a small number of modules can contain most of the defects. And point number two is, those defects can be responsible for most of the operational failures. Though these are only a few modules, the defects present in them can cause operational failure. What is operational failure? It is when the product is in use and fails to perform according to expectations. So if we can identify the module or the part of the software that contains these defects, then it will help us reduce or eliminate costly changes. If we find them during our testings, then they won't crop up during live use and we can save the expenses on correcting them. So that's the fourth principle to identify the module where most of the defects are clustered together. Now we're on to the fifth principle of testing. Principle 5 states, beware of the pesticide paradox. What does this mean? Let's find out. Point 1. The same test no longer finds defects. During testing, if you've already found a defect in a code, then it is unlikely that you will find a defect again. 
Unless there is a big change in the code, you will find no more errors, since you already found one and corrected it. So then what do we do? Point 2. To detect new defects, existing tests and test data may need to change. So you either have to update the test case or the data in it to be able to find new defects in it. And the third point is, when you're performing automated regression testing, the pesticide paradox has a beneficial outcome. When you run automated testings, you are actually running scripts. So if you run the same script, it is highly unlikely that you will find new defects. But if you update your script, add new values to it, or new test cases to it, then there is a possibility of discovering new defects. So this paradox is very beneficial when you're performing an automated testing. Suppose there is a software with 20 defects in it. When you run your script the first time, you find 5 defects. Then, the software is left with 15 defects. Now, if you don't change the test script and you run it for the second and third time, you will find no more defects in the software. No matter how many times you run it, you cannot find the 15 remaining defects. This is because you're running the same script. In order to find new defects, you have to update your script. So this is why our first point said that the same test will no longer find defects. And the second one said, to detect new one, existing tests may need to change. So now you understand the fifth principle. We will cover the sixth principle. It states that testing is context dependent. This means that the type of testing will depend upon the kind of product being tested. This is why testing is context dependent. So let's start breaking this down. Point 1. Safety critical industry control software is tested differently from an e-commerce mobile app. So a mobile application and a safety critical software will be tested differently. We can't use the same process for both applications. Now, point 2. Testing in an Agile project is done differently than testing in a sequential life cycle project. Our methods of testing in an Agile project is completely different from how we test in a sequential life cycle project. The final point is all about e-commerce. This is connected to the first point. How we test e-commerce is completely different. This is why Principle 6 emphasizes that testing is context-dependent. This principle states that absence of error is a fallacy. If you remember, we have already covered the essence of this in Principle 1 and 2. Let's deconstruct that. Point 1. In an organization, it is expected that testers can run all possible tests and find all possible defects. This expectation is completely wrong. We can't run all possible tests and we cannot find all possible defects. Point 2 says Principle 2 and 1 respectively tell us that this is impossible. If you recall, Principle 2 says that exhaustive testing is impossible and 1 says that we can never find all the bugs. We can claim to have found a bug, but we cannot claim that there are no defects left in the software. Further, it is a fallacy that is a mistaken belief. So this is an incorrect belief that a tester can find all the mistakes that exist in a software. Our final point here is thoroughly testing all specify requirements and fixing all defects found could still produce a system that is difficult to use. Even if we do everything, there can still be environmental conditions, unfound defects, or other factors that can cause the product to fail. It's not in your hands. 
This is why we cannot say that there are no errors left in a software. If someone claims that, then it is a mistaken belief. Before we end this video, let's have a look into the important points.